With the chase for velocity spiking injuries across the league, I can't help but come to appreciate the crafty hurlers of years past. Not too long ago, pitchers didn't need to throw in the mid-90s to compete in MLB. It's becoming a lost art, and there's one man who defines this legacy perhaps better than any other pitcher. Orlando Hernandez, or El Duque, pitched in MLB for less than 10 years, but the impact he left on the sport was substantial. A four-time World Series champion who featured one of the most iconic deliveries in MLB history. His story is one of dominant in the highest pressure situations, doing so with the most unconventional of arsenals. And today, we're going to tell his story. For years, Orlando Hernandez was the star right-hander for the Capitals, one of the best Cuban baseball teams, all the while just making $10 a month as a sports trainer in a Havana mental hospital. But after helping players defect from Cuba, like his younger brother, Levon Hernandez, who went on to have a successful pitching career, he was banned from the Cuban national team and did not pitch competitively for an entire year. Later on in that same year, 1997, he was threatened at his home, and Orlando finally made the decision to defect from Cuba himself. Eleven days later, he left, using a compass made from household magnets. His family and friends brought four cans of Spam, some stale bread, and a tank of fresh water on their journey across the sea. They washed up on a Bahamian island, and after being discovered by U.S. officials, Hernandez decided not to travel to the States right away, stating that he would not leave the Bahamas until he was sure his companions and family would not be returned to Cuba. He instead traveled to Nicaragua, and by remaining outside of the country, he avoided the MLB draft. After gaining residency in the U.S., he ended up signing a four-year, $6.6 million contract with the New York Yankees. That definitely wasn't his only offer, though. Apparently, he passed up a $5 million contract with an inclusion of a movie deal with Disney from the Los Angeles Angels. Yes, a starting pitcher passed on an Angels contract. Some things never change, guys. He featured a funky repertoire paired with odd arm angles to keep opposing hitters guessing. His signature pitch was a sinking fastball that sat in the mid 80s, rarely breaching 90 miles per hour, but it didn't need velocity to torment right-handed hitters. His overhand curveball would frequently be buried below the zone, keeping hitters off balance. The speed of this pitch would plummet down to the low 70s and high 60s. His wicked slider, usually thrown sidearm, would often be his chase and strikeout pitch. This doesn't even mention how far up his leg would come during his motion, as Hernandez could practically kiss his knee on any pitch. The 1998 Yankees, who were 39-13 and 13 at the time of his debut, were absolutely rolling when the Cuban legend took the mound for the first time. With such a potent offense and dominant pitching staff, El Duque was thought to be a wild card or bonus piece for the successful team more than anything else, but he made it clear in his debut that he was going to be a weapon moving forward. Against the Tampa Bay Devil Rays, you know, any chance I get to call them the Devil Rays, I have to take because, you know, what, what a fun team name. Can we, can we bring this back? Look at this logo. This is awesome. Bring back the Devil Rays. Orlando pitched seven innings with seven strikeouts in a dominant 7-1 victory. After tossing 116 pitches in his debut, El Duque tossed 126 pitches in his next start, a complete game win over the Montreal Expos. He proved early on that he was a workhorse, and by the end of his rookie season, just five of his 21 starts went less than six full innings. By his third month in August, Hernandez had fully gotten comfortable in MLB. That month, he managed a 2.40 ERA in six starts. In August, he averaged over seven innings per outing and held hitters to a 161 batting average against. It was a wildly successful rookie year for El Duque, who stepped into the rotation two months into the season and looked like he had been there for years. He managed a 3.13 ERA, 10th best in baseball among the pitchers with at least 140 innings that season. It was good for a 141 ERA plus in the steroid era. His 219 batting average against ranked seventh among all pitchers, ahead of Randy Johnson and John Smoltz as a rookie. Much like he would all of his career, he tormented right handed hitters with his bowling ball fastball and devastating breaking pitches. Righties managed just a 468 OPS and over 250 plate appearances against El Duque in 1998. It's still shocking that this performance as a first year player only got Hernandez fourth place in American League Rookie of the Year voting, because outside of sample size, he outshined all the names in front of him, including winner Ben Grieve. Be honest with me, if you're not an Oakland A's fan, have you heard of Ben Grieve? I hadn't heard of Ben Grieve before this. Good ball player, but we're talking about El Duque here. I guess he went to the Hideki Matsui school of being a foreign player and getting snubbed for Rookie of the Year while playing for the Yankees. Am I right, guys? That was a very niche, very specific baseball joke. This is what I bring to the table. But aside from this personal accolade, Orlando had his sights set on a much bigger prize. After sweeping the Texas Rangers while only allowing one run in three games in the ALDS, the good pitching continued for the Yankees when Hernandez took the pill in the postseason for the first time in Game 4 of the Championship Series. Against the Cleveland 
Cleveland Indians, who were up two games to one, El Duque outdueled Doc Gooden, the same pitcher that inspired his iconic leg kick. He tossed seven scoreless frames and struck out more batters than base runners he allowed, paving the way for an easy 4 0 win to tie the series. The Yankees won two more in a row after that to punch their ticket to the World Series for the second time in three years. After outslugging the San Diego Padres to claim game one, El Duque got the ball once again in game two, looking to further the Yankees series lead. Though it wasn't a spotless performance like his first outing, he was nearly just as good, with one earned run allowed in seven innings. His 14 innings of one run ball and two starts was key as the dominant 114 win Yankees cruised to a World Series sweep, making El Duque a champion in his first season. As most of you know, there will be plenty more winning where that came from. In 1999, the beginning of the year was not kind to El Duque, as he labored through his first eight starts with an ERA well over six, but a complete game shutout against the Devil Rays, there they are again. It's just fun, right? Rays is kind of bland. Devil Rays it really pops, you know? I'm getting sidetracked. Helped him hit the reset button. Hernandez pitched his first full season, eclipsing 200 innings by a decent margin and managing a 114 ERA plus, but he regressed a bit in strikeouts, walks, and home runs allowed. Hernandez saved his best outings of the year for October. In game one of the 1999 American League Division Series facing the Texas Rangers once again, El Duque stymied their potent offense with eight scoreless innings, maneuvering his way around six walks to earn a clutch victory. Would you believe that in back-to-back -back years, the Texas Rangers played the New York Yankees in the ALDS, and both times they scored just one run in three games and lost all three of them? Back-to-back -back years, exact same playoff result. Rangers fans, you deserve that World Series from last year. I can't say it enough. A tougher challenge lay ahead, as the rival Boston Red Sox were the last American League team standing in the way of the Yankees reaching the World Series yet again. El Duque got the ball in an ever-important Game 1, and he again gave New York eight innings of his best work. Hernandez would get another start in the same playoff series, taking the mound at Fenway Park in Game 5. He dealt against the Red Sox yet again with seven innings of one-run ball, managing nine base runners and securing the win for New York. The Yankees clinched the ALCS with that win, and unsurprisingly, ALCS MVP honors went to El Duque. With his 15 innings and three earned runs carrying a ton of the weight. The Yankees rode that hot hand, giving him the ball in their very next game, the opener of the World Series against the Braves. El Duque responded with his best outing of the year. He allowed just one hit, a solo home run to the MVP winner in the National League, Chipper Jones, and proceeded to punch out 10 Atlanta hitters over seven brilliant innings to secure yet another win. With this victory, El Duque had pitched 44 innings with a 1.02 ERA and 5-0 record through his first six postseason starts. He's one of just 15 pitchers since the beginning of the expansion era in 1961 with an ERA of two or lower in their first six playoff appearances with a minimum of 30 innings pitched. He has the lowest ERA of any pitcher here too, only rivaled by the great Sandy Koufax. A brief interruption on today's video to thank today's sponsor, which is Mova Globe. So look, I have a Mova Globe right here of the New York Yankees, El Duque's favorite team. If you're not a Yankees fan like myself, you can also get a Mets Mova Globe, Dodgers, Cubs, Astros, Braces, a ton of different designs available on their website right now. And there's no cables, no batteries needed. This thing is powered by ambient light, so it's going to rotate on its own. So click the link in my description and use code jolly 10 right now for 10% off your order. That's code jolly 10 for 10% off all MOB licensed globes. Thank you to them for sponsoring today's video, now let's get back to the story of El Duque. The next few seasons were more of the same. El Duque put together above average regular season numbers, ate a ton of innings along the way, and then locked in for his postseason outings. And after three seasons in the bigs, El Duque had three World Series rings. The Bronx Bombers were finally toppled over in the 2001 Fall Classic against the Arizona Diamondbacks, and this signaled the beginning of the end for El Duque and pinstripes. Toe surgery in 2001 and a back strain in 2002 began to slow down El Duque. While he pitched through the ailments, clubhouse affairs began to affect Hernandez as well. Halfway through the 2002 campaign, the Yankees stripped El Duque of his translator with the expectation that he would learn English. This angered not only him, but many of the Hispanic players and coaches around the league. Ozzy Guillen, then the third base coach of the Marlins, was very outspoken on this issue. In a quote, he said, interpreters are provided for Japanese and Korean players. Are they better than Latin players? They're telling the Latin guys to suck it up. Things boiled to a head in September when El Duque and his own catch 
Thatcher, Jorge Posada, got involved in a clubhouse altercation where Hernandez apparently landed a punch on his battery mate. Who knows exactly what was said here, but the funny part is, the next day, Posada had to suit up and catch El Duque's next start like nothing was wrong. Can you guys guess who it was against? It was against the Devil Rays. After a solid but abridged season in 2002, the Yankees decided to trade Hernandez, who was entering the final year of his contract. El Duque became a Montreal Expo. Except, Hernandez never actually pitched for the Expos. A serious injury to his rotator cuff and his throwing shoulder required surgery, and sidelined him for the entirety of his contract year. Funnily enough, as soon as he had free agency, the New York Yankees decided to just bring him back and re-add him to the rotation on a one-year contract worth the league minimum. He returned from his surgery recovery in mid-July, and once he read down the pinstripes, it was like he never left. He got the chance to pitch for the Yankees in the playoffs once again. The team handed him the ball up 3 to nothing in the ALCS against the rival Red Sox. But unlike many of his October outings before, El Duque didn't have his best stuff, walking five and allowing three runs in five innings. He squandered the chance for another iconic outing, and instead of a series clinching victory, this game four loss in extra innings sent the Yankees down a path towards a blown 3-0 series lead, the only such collapse in baseball history. This is how El Duque's Yankees journey finally came to its conclusion. Hernandez re-entered the free agent pool, not drawing a ton of suitors for his demand of a multi-year deal. He ended up on the South Side, joining the Chicago White Sox on a two-year, $8 million deal, where he linked up with the man who defended him years before, sophomore manager Ozzy Guillen. The White Sox had constructed a super rotation of durable aces, with Mark Burley, Freddie Garcia, John Garland, and Jose Contreras all pitching over 200 innings with an ERA plus of 115 or better that season. The only part of the starting pitching plan that really didn't work out was El Duque, who embarked on his most lackluster regular season to that point. But just like the rest of his career, El Duque was simply saving his best outings for when it mattered most. The 2005 White Sox were AL Central Division champions. The White Sox were one win away from clinching the division series as they headed for Fenway Park. In a bold move, Ozzy Guillen went to his long reliever, El Duque, in a dire situation with a one-run lead to protect. Facing a strong Boston offense with the bases juiced and nobody out, El Duque threw 21 pitches and wiggled his way out of the jam. He induced two pop-outs and struck out Johnny Damon in a clutch moment, keeping the Red Sox off the board and maintaining Chicago's lead. He ended up pitching three scoreless innings that game, helping Chicago navigate another win to sweep the Red Sox out of the playoffs. He wouldn't pitch again until Game 3 of the World Series, in the ninth inning of a tie game with Chicago leading the series 2-0. Hernandez needed a strikeout with the bases loaded to escape the jam. He did just that, escaping by the skin of his teeth and forcing extra innings, where the White Sox would prevail in 14 frames. El Duque didn't pitch a lot on this run, but his key contributions in these two pivotal moments helped the South Side break their championship drought, giving him his fourth World Series ring in his eighth season as a big leaguer. His final playoff run here put him over 100 career postseason innings pitched, one of just 32 pitchers in baseball history to accomplish that feat. Of this class, his 2.55 ERA is seventh best, better than the entire Braves trio of the 1990s as well as current and future Hall of Famers in Randy Johnson, Justin Verlander, and Max Scherzer. Simply put, El Duque is one of the best postseason pitchers in the history of the sport. 2005 would be his last postseason tour, however, as his career began to wind down entering his 40s. He got shipped around again, getting flipped by the White Sox in a deal to the Diamondbacks, and after just nine poor starts there, the Snakes cut ties with him and flipped him back to New York for a reliever. Except this time, he wasn't in New York pitching for the Yankees. It'd be the upstart Mets instead. People tend to forget this, but Hernandez was honestly great during his time with the Mets in his final years. He made 20 starts with a 107 ERA+, plus. he especially shined in September with a 2.01 ERA in 5 starts and a 1.08 whip along the way. They decided to ride the hot hand and give El Duque the ball in Game 1 of the NLDS, but the day before the playoffs kicked off, he tore a calf muscle running sprints and had to be scratched from the playoff roster altogether, missing the 2006 postseason. He pitched well in 2007, but by this point, at age 41, the injuries piled up on El Duque. He had neck issues in spring training, then he missed most of May with bursitis in his right shoulder. Even after staying healthy and pitching well the next three months, Hernandez once again went down when his team needed him most, with a strained tendon in his right foot that would require surgery at the end of the season. The Mets cut ties with him, and though the Texas Rangers and Washington Nationals took minor league flyers, El Duque officially decided to hang up his cleats during the 2011 season. Over 200 starts, over 1,000 strikeouts, 90 
League career wins and four World Series rings later, El Duque's story to big league stardom is remarkable. He became one of the most enigmatic pitchers in recent baseball history, and his story was truly so fun to recount. But that'll do it for today's video. If you guys enjoyed the video, make sure you leave a like on it and consider subscribing to the Jolly Elf channel. I'd really appreciate it. But that'll do it for me. I'll see you guys next time.